Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. We looked at verses 1 through 6 last week. This week we're looking at verses 7 through 12. I'll read the entirety of the text though. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He who is able to accept it, let him accept it. Father, help us today in your word to know you and to know what you have taught us. Lord, this is a difficult passage, uh, many difficult words and phrasings here. I pray that you would cause us to calmly think through your scripture and to be obedient to it, to be encouraged by it as we understand it. By your grace, we pray these things. Amen. So the permanence of the marriage relationship is clearly expected by God. Uh, this text makes that very clear. God has shown for us Moses the prophet in Judah, Genesis 2.24, to Jesus the Son of God in Matthew 19.6, to Paul the Apostle in Ephesians 5, verse 31. However, only Jesus makes this statement about the permanence of marriage, God's intended permanence in a marriage relationship, so explicit in his intent expired commentary as the creator himself. He says, what God has joined together, let not men separate. See, the worldview of marriage permanence has always been a problem in all cultures for all time. For the most pagan, even to the most religious cultures. The fact that Deuteronomy 24, which is the passage of scripture that these Pharisees are quoting to Jesus addresses what to do when the marriage covenant is broken and regulates then the sinful failure shows us that before the law was even completed, before Deuteronomy was even finished, there was a problem with marriages. They were not being fulfilled as God had intended. Jesus appeals beyond or for, before the Deuteronomy passage to the primary passage, the principal passage, the first in the beginning passage, Genesis chapter 2, and says, yes, God did permit divorce because of hardness of hearts, sinful failure, but don't, don't, dis, don't confuse his permitting and the failures of men as God's desire. His principle was what God has joined together, let not men separate. That's what he's saying in this text of Scripture. Today, our culture, I think as well as what we're reading here, has devalued marriage as a sobering covenant and turned it into a simple way to express supposed love or convenience. And as marriage becomes more and more inconvenient, it becomes less and less important. And so the disillusion of the marriage idea as a covenant, and even as I've noticed as a pastor, the wedding ceremony as a solemn occasion has deeply undermined what God has determined from the beginning. That this is a covenant that God has intended male and female to enter into. I mean, would you not agree with me from your observations alone that the concept of marriage is flippantly considered today? And the concept of marriage permanence nature is mocked and undermined? 
Would you also not agree that then Jesus' words on the permanence of marriage are as timely today as they were when these Pharisees first came to test him? Let's think back through the text of Scripture as Jesus travels to Jerusalem here in Matthew to be crucified and to rise from the dead in about six months from this time. He is met by a group of Pharisees. These Pharisees have come to put him to the test, the Scripture says, to entangle him with words and questions about intricate interpretations of words and phrases within the obscure regulations of the Torah. And Jesus answers their questions this time. He doesn't always answer their questions, but this time he does. Because the issue of marriage is such a significant issue that his disciples and us must understand and obey. The question they ask him is all about the traditional interpretation of one phrase in the law. It is about if marriage can be dissolved for just any reason. A word found in Deuteronomy 24, uncleanness. Inappropriateness is the word in the Hebrew And they had developed many schools of thought, two primary ones and one that was popular in the day, based on that word, one word, uncleanness, as to whether or not it was permissible to dissolve a marriage for just any cause. And that was the prevailing opinion, that yes, it was. A man was very patriarchal in the wrong way, in the wrong kind of fashion, that devalued women, devalued marriage. I'm not saying that all the culture was. I'm saying their interpretation was. That wasn't the way God intended it to be. And they had taken this to mean, I have the upper hand. If I don't like what my wife is doing, any reason I can dissolve the marriage covenant. It seems to be such a um, pervasive opinion that even the disciples hold to this opinion. Now, they hadn't been taught yet by Jesus on this matter, but they even seem to hold to this opinion. They're surprised that Jesus goes against the current view of marriage being dissolved for any reason. In his profound, authoritative answer concerning the limits of divorce, Jesus backs up to the first words in the law, in the beginning, an appeal to creation and creation's impact in the design of male and female in the marriage relationship is an authoritative appeal. Jesus teaches five principles concerning marriage. We looked at these in detail last week. Marriage's purpose is companionship. Marriage's persons are two, male, female. Marriage's primacy is leave and be joined. Marriage's point is to become one flesh. And marriage's permanence is a divine command. What God has joined, let not men separate. From these five purposes, we actually can see Jesus' logical process. Each one bleeds into the next. If the purpose is companionship, who are to be the companions? These two. If these two are to be companions, what role does this have in other relationships? Well, this one is the primary relationship. Well, since it's the primary relationship, what's the point? Well, then these two becoming one flesh. And since they are becoming one flesh, how long must this last? Well, one flesh is a permanent, earthly speaking, ideal. Don't separate that one flesh. As you can see, the logical progression as he builds his case, and actually what he's doing is not necessarily just teaching a thorough study on marriage, but he's answering their question about divorce for any cause. And he's emphasizing that last aspect of the principles of marriage, and that is the permanence of it. It's intended to be for a lifetime. God's plan from the beginning is for a lifetime of covenantal companionship between husband and wife. This permanence of marriage is God's idea. Thus, God's people must pursue marriage as a permanent relationship in this life. Yet, God's will that a marriage is a permanent relationship is but a shadowy illustration of a greater relationship that lasts beyond this lifetime. And I believe the apostle, I believe that Jesus here and the Apostle Paul in um, uh, Ephesians even more so, but I believe that Jesus here will show us how he makes a connection between what he's teaching on marriage and the kingdom of God. And using marriage as an illustration of a greater relationship. We'll get to that at the end. But it's the relationship that God has with his kingdom people. A faithful husband, he pursues an eternal relationship with his spouse, his people, his co- a covenant that has no end. Though we may be faithless, he will not be found unfaithful what he's teaching. At the conclusion of the sermon today, I I hope to be able to show us from this passage how Jesus makes this transition. Well, we ended our sermon last week 
pointing out these five principles of marriage that Jesus expounds through verse 6. We are picking up the conversation with a response from the Pharisees this morning. So we want to jump right into the text we read and look at verse 7. That Now their response to Jesus' answer. Their first question is trying to entangle him. Any cause for divorce? Uh, assuming that he will go against the, corp- the, the populist view and side with the old-fashioned view. He actually does neither. Jesus responds with more than they asked for. With teachings on marriage as a principle, more than just a quick answer to the question. But culminating in an answer to the question, no, not for any cause, because what God has joined together, let not man separate. So he does answer them in this. And now they respond. And he's falling right into their hands, they think. Aha! Now we've got him. So let's bring the proof text to bear. Aha! You say, no, but why then does Moses say yes? That's what, the, that's what they're basically saying. Their hope being, they can prove that he is not Messiah, not prophet of God, because you cannot be the prophet of God, the prophet, the Messiah, and, agree, and disagree with other prophets like Moses. And so they bring this to bear. They won't let it go. They double down and they're putting into the test. They show their hand. Jesus already knew what they were doing though, right? And they quickly refer to Deuteronomy 24 again. Unlike Jesus though, who accurately quotes the scripture. And did you notice how logically Jesus using the Genesis passages moves from point to point? He, I love this. Jesus exposited Genesis 1 in his answer here. In Genesis 2. He exposited. He took the explanation as in its context and he made application and it was a logical flow of thought. Jesus does this. Unlike them, though, the Pharisees miss the context of Deuteronomy 24, misquote the scripture, and make a wrong conclusion. Exact opposite of the kind of teacher that Jesus is. Allow me to explain what the very words Matthew tells us they use. Notice the word here. Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? There's a slight little difference there. I don't know if you noticed it. Jesus does because Jesus corrects their misquoting of the scripture. Do you notice in verse 8? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. Did you notice the slight difference? They say, why did Moses command it? Jesus says, wait, wait a minute. What you're speaking of as a command was something that Moses allowed. And there is a difference between something that is commanded and something that is allowed. And Jesus makes that clear in his words. Well, first, backing up even past that, they're misquoting. The whole passage in Deuteronomy 24 is not even about marriage and divorce. The context of it. We looked at this last week. But the scenario in Deuteronomy chapter 24 is regulating what happens when a woman who has been divorced wants to go back to her first husband because her other husband divorced her or she or he died or something. It's not even about the allowance of divorce. It's what to do when it happens and then she wants to go back. Is that, is that lawful? Is that possible? You see, they take something that's not even about the main point and they turn it into a command from God. It wasn't even about that. And the point is, Moses says, give her a bill of, give her a legal writing of divorcement so she has proof that she's been divorced to protect her protect you so that we'll know that she can't go back and perhaps not going back to her first husband will be a reminder to you as Jewish people that not to handle this divorce issue lightly not to handle the marriage issue lightly that it ought to be something that ought to be cherished it's a don't go back kind of idea so don't enter into it flippantly that's, that's the reason for the Deuteronomy 24 passage. You see how they took that, this idea of, hey, let's, let's be very careful about this. Be serious about divorce. Don't just do it flippantly. Make sure it's done legally. You don't, you don't want to have problems with property and all that kind of stuff. And they took these regulations of something that should never happen in the first place, and they turned it into a command. Oh, I'm supposed to divorce her for anything I find wrong with her. That, who does that? Well, the Pharisees do. 
Their misuse of the context makes them, makes them make a terrible assumption or application that Jesus is careful to correct. Jesus is being intentionally clear. They were taking what was a regrettable issue that God wanted to control with the least amount of damage as possible and turning that into a command to be obeyed. That God would allow or permit something because of hard hearts and with a compassionate desire to protect their heart and evil wills from doing more damage can in no way be taken as a command to do evil. Jesus had already taught this in the Sermon on the Mount. That you may be permitted legally to retaliate when one strikes you on the cheek, but that does not mean that you must. You can live differently. You can have a kingdom kind of living. It means to choose differently and then turn your other cheek. In other words, just because you can do something does not now mean you must do that thing. And then third, this misquote of permit change to command led them to neglect God's principles in favor of a legalistic and selfish looking for of loopholes and situations where they can get away with as much as they can while still being able to piously declare themselves righteous. Jesus clarifies verse 8 and 9 on this wrong response. And I believe we must pay attention to Jesus' clarification. Not just so that we can understand divorce but so that we can be careful not to make the same devastating mistakes they make in their approach to God's Word. First thing I notice is that their entire approach to Scripture is wrong. Their entire approach to Scripture is wrong. The fact that they, the Pharisees, are quick to take what God permits and make it a command reveals not a misunderstanding of this one issue alone but of a wrong-headedness in their entire approach to the Scriptures. They were masters at reading the Scripture through selfish eyes in order to find a way to justify sinfulness. So when they come to the passage of Scripture, allowing for a bill of divorce, so that the wife who has been released as an official paper, so no one will think she just left her husband, they turn this into a justification for getting divorced when their wife displeases them for any cause. They viewed the Holy Scripture not as a revelation of the heart and intents of a holy, righteous, and good God, but as a legal book filled with loopholes so that I can stay right with God and my conscience can be clean by doing this or not doing that, while yet satisfying the flesh. In some ways this speaks to religion and Christianity today. How do you view this book? As a legalist description of what makes you a good or bad person? A collection of rules or guidelines to make you feel good as you check your obedience off the list? Or as it has been given to us? A perfect witness of a good and holy God who not only tells us what righteousness is, but shows us what grace is and compels us to look in his love letter from heaven to find the gift of grace in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation, the self-revelation of God from heaven, of the almighty creator. It's not an encyclopedia of morality so that I can feel better about myself for doing better than another person. Let us not be like the Pharisees who twist the intention of God's word and in this particular issue, twist God's principles of marriage permanence because they're desperately finding a loophole so that they can live as they please while not feeling guilty about their lifestyle choice. The scriptures primarily approach to us righteousness through the explanation of principles. God wants us to apply. So first I noticed that their approach to Scripture is just entirely wrong. But also, as Jesus points out, it's not the only thing that's wrong. Their hearts are entirely wrong too. Yet, the reason their approach to the Scripture is wrong is because of what he calls the hardness of hearts. Now, I find it interesting, I don't know if you noticed this, that Jesus addresses the reason for Moses even writing the specific regulations for how the legal paper in divorce proceeding was to go, and particularly the fact that the first wife was not to go back, but they were to take the divorce seriously, as brought about because of those in Moses' time having hard hearts, right? But did you notice that Jesus does not say in the text of Scripture, 
because of the hardness of their hearts, he instructed a writing of divorce. Did you notice that? He says, because of the hardness of your hearts. Now, what does he mean? Because he's talking about something that was written thousands of years before. <coughs> and he's applying it as they, they have hard hearts. It appears that Jesus is aligning these Pharisees today and their hearts hardened against him. The living revelation word of God with those who would not follow Moses' teaching concerning marriage and its permanence, those hardened against the written revelation, the word of God. In its essence, it seems that he's saying they had hard hearts and God had to regulate their hardness and you have hard hearts because you will not receive me. My truth, what I say as God. I believe Jesus is making a connection between he and the word of God, that he is the living word of God. He is the revelation of God. And he is equally the revelation of God as the words they read in Genesis. That's the word of God. And he's the word of God. And to reject the, Moses is to reject him. And to reject him is to reject Moses. They're trying to pit the two against one another. Jesus says, no, they had hard hearts. You have hard hearts. And just like Moses permitted it, we see the same hardness in your hearts today toward me. But think with me for just a minute that this is the amazing grace of God. He teaches the holy principle. One woman, one man, one lifetime. But he knows. He knows humans have hard hearts. So he allows Moses to regulate their sin. Think about that phrase for just a minute. He allows Moses to regulate sin. Think about that in your own life. Isn't it an amazing mercy of God that he regulates our sin? I mean, think about it with just for a minute. When we sin, what do we deserve? Judgment. We deserve swift judgment from God. Think about Genesis and Deuteronomy. Moses wrote both. So in one man's lifetime, he writes the permanence of marriage. And in that lifetime, their hard hearts blow it up. And what does God do? My first principle I laid down, the permanence of marriage you can't keep. Be gone with the lot of you. Strike you down. No, he says, let's regulate it. People are hurt by the sin. I don't approve of the sin. I don't approve of, of this. You, you know, I, I'm, but I'm going to allow, I'm going to allow some, some regulation of your wickedness. Isn't that a mercy of God? It's kind of like this if you think about it. Kind of like getting to take some aspirin after intentionally smashing your head against a wall. I mean, if you did that and you went and you smashed your head against a wall and then you say, I've got a headache. Did anybody go around and say, oh, I'm so sorry. How did that happen? What? Oh, that's so bad for you. You know, what, what do we want to say to someone like that? You idiot. <laughs> you did it yourself, right? Why are you complaining about that which you have done? But, but isn't it a blessing? Because all of us have done those foolish things in life, right? Where we've inflicted ourself with pain. But isn't it a merciful thing that even when the pain is self-inflicted, God has allowed for a dullness to it? He has allowed us to take aspirin for hurting ourselves. In the spiritual sense, this is what was going on in Deuteronomy. It wasn't God's will. God didn't command it or call, call on people to divorce. But He knew in his mercy, in his grace, in his wisdom, he knows the sinful hearts of man and the hardness of hearts. And he creates an allowance to try to mitigate some of the disaster. To try to slow down some of the burn and the destruction. I don't know about you, but when I read Deuteronomy 24, I don't see a legal loophole. I see a gracious God. A gracious God who knows this is my intention. But this is what you're going to do. 
and this is how I'm going to mitigate the disaster that it will be. Don't we have an amazing God that doesn't let us fulfill and bring about the fullness of what we are deserved in our life? Think about that. Be care, but be careful not to miss that Jesus clearly says divorce was never his idea. It was a gracious permission because human hearts are hard. So their hearts are wrong. Their approach to scripture is wrong. Thus, we should not be surprised that, surprised that their interpretation of that whole idea of divorce and marriage would be wrong too. It brings us to the main debate issue in this passage. Having a wrong approach to scripture and hard hearts we see that they get the interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 wrong as well. The simplest way to understand this is that Jesus is saying, no, it was always my intention that your marriage last one lifetime, male and female, one flesh. Divorce was never God's command or design. From the beginning it was not so, he repeats. And to point this out, Jesus with authority says that to dissolve the marriage bonds is an adulterous act. It is not something that God would command because a faithful God despises adultery. So he's saying, how would God command divorce when a divorce is an adulterous act? That's what Jesus is saying in the text when he goes on to say that. That doesn't make any sense. It's not I, Jesus is saying, I'm not the one who's not making sense. You're the ones who aren't making sense here. That's, you're trying to get me to contradict Moses, but your interpretation of Moses has him contradicting himself, God contradicting God. So obviously you're missing something, he's saying here. You're missing something because you don't understand that this divorce is an adulterous act. It's not wrong. It's unfaithfulness. God wouldn't do that. But this seems quite extreme. And how could Jesus now say no divorce ever when Moses seemed to say something different? still is the question of what then Moses was going on there. Jesus adds this little phrase, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality. Aha! And now we've come across, as if you've heard any sermons or you've studied this out, the famous exception clause, as people say it. But I gotta say, I can't stand calling this the exception clause. You know why? Because that sounds exactly like the Pharisees. Aha! <laughs> we found the cause, we found the loophole. We found that exception. And I think we ought to be careful about approaching Scripture that way. Where we're looking at it, and, we're, and the whole point of Jesus' text here is not about this except for sexual immorality, but what gets all the attention in this passage of Scripture. Just like in Deuteronomy, the point was not about except for uncleanness. That gets all the, the play, and it really wasn't the passage it was about. Why do we then do the same thing when we look at Matthew 19? And we just find that one little word. And, Aha, here, let's talk about this. In fact, I will tell you, and I understand the need. I'm glad that he did it. But one of the commentaries I read had, had six pages on this one phrase. And he was trying to explain all the viewpoints of this one little phrase. And I'm glad he did it because I wanted to read them. Uh, but the reality is, I'm thinking, isn't that kind of funny how we find ourselves doing the same thing the Pharisees did? God gives the principle. We highlight the little, we found an exception. We found a loophole. Aha, uh -huh. I, knew, I knew there was a way out. <laughs> I knew there was something we could do. Let's not have pharisaical hearts where we're always looking for the loophole. God's intention is a marriage forever, but he does say this except for sexual immorality. So we have to think, what does he mean by this? Just please stop calling it, we ought to stop calling it the exception clause. That sounds too pharisaical. What does he mean in principle here though? I don't believe Jesus was giving a way out of the marriage with this phrase. Those who understand what God's intention was from the beginning are not looking for a way out. We look for ways to have marriages as God has always intended. But we do live in a fallen world. And Jesus seems to recognize this. First thing we need to be certain that we guard against is this pharisaical, pharisaical thinking and get into endless debates about what this word means and doesn't mean and doesn't mean and what about that and doesn't what about this scenario and that scenario what about this issue and that issue second thing we need to understand is that Jesus is not repeating Deuteronomy now this is important the words that Jesus uses here are not even closely related to Deuteronomy 24 words the word uncleanness that Moses uses is not even similar in the Hebrew to the Greek word porneia here, 
sexual morality. So I don't believe Jesus is just requoting that passage. Jesus, as the author of Scripture, is giving his divine teaching on the matter. With authority, he's teaching them. We could have an entire sermon on, once again, Jesus proves his divine authority as God to absolutely teach God's word straight from his mouth to them. This word, sexual morality or porneia, fornication, as I said, is not the equivalent of the Hebrew word uncleanness. The word porneia used here simply is a general word to describe sexual sinfulness. It's not the word adultery. Some people say, well, except for adultery. Not the word adultery. The word adultery is going to actually be used in the same, same verse. Moikia, this is not the same word. The reason I think that Jesus uses this word porneia, I don't believe it's just to point to one type of sin that tends to dissolve the marriage union God intended to be permanent. You ever wondered why that is when you read this passage of scripture? Why it says, except for sexual morality? You know, one one can, should not divorce his wife, except for sexual immorality is the idea there. And thought, well, what about murder? That one doesn't count? Like, don't be sexually immoral, but you can murder somebody and marriage has to stay the same if it's murder. I mean, ever wondered why it's like this word is chosen here by God and, and not many other egregious sins? I, I have. In fact, I spent a great deal of time trying to work through this. I'm still trying to work through it a little bit. I, I believe there's a reason why Jesus used this word porneia, and I don't believe it's to just pinpoint one specific act. You see, in the marriage relationship, which is a covenantal relationship, some sins break that covenant to the point where it may be unrestorable. And I believe that's why Jesus brings up the word porneia there. General word describing all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of sexual sins, not just adultery, um, but, but all manner. And I believe Jesus is using this as an example word to say there is grace because sometimes, though the purpose is permanence in the marriage union, sometimes the covenant is broken beyond repair. Sometimes it's broken beyond repair. Sexual morality will do that. It's the most obvious expression of the destruction of the marriage covenant. It's the most obvious expression of the one flesh relationship. Paul the Apostle wrote about another thing that breaks the covenant of marriage. And he ex expressed that one could leave, be divorced for this cause. And that was a very obvious breaking of the covenant. That was that the unbeliever leaves. <laughs> They're no longer there anymore. It broke the covenant. Jesus' point is not to legitimatize divorce, legitimize divorce, but to point out that their co contemporary divorce for just any cause was not Moses' idea. It was not God's idea. It is their hardened heart's idea, but that from the beginning, God took the marriage of man and woman seriously and intended permanence. But at times, a sin such as porneia, when unrepented of, will so damage the marriage covenant, or as Paul says, when the unbeliever leaves, it will so damage the marriage, co marriage covenant that there even then is is a mercy granted to that person who has been sinned against that their divorce and probable remarriage will not be considered adultery. I believe that's what Jesus is saying here. But if you find yourself in this situation, it, it, though divorce is adulterous, it will not be considered adultery in this situation. This kind of breaking of the marriage covenant. As I said last week, not all divorce is sin, but all divorce is caused by some sin. Beloved, some of you here today may understandably hurt in hearing this word of God. You may be the victim of a failed marriage. You may be the cause of a failed marriage. Perhaps you sexually were sexually immoral. Or you divorced your spouse out of a hardness of heart. I wish to encourage you that while not undermining the sanctity of marriage and God's intention that it be permanent, God extends grace to the humble and repentant. It is all through this passage. If your spouse broke the marriage covenant and you're divorced and remarried, 
I believe this text of Jesus would indicate you ought not feel that you are under the bondage of guilt. If you broke the marriage covenant, or you simply got divorced, but not for sexual immorality, having repented, rest in the grace of God, knowing that His mercy covers your failure. And if you are remarried, rejoice in the grace of God. Seek not to fail by God's help. You're not a perpetual adulterer. But if you are married, you are thinking of divorce. You think there's no way out. You're just too incompatible. Marriage is too difficult. I urge you by the grace of God, hear the word of God. Hear Jesus and understand. Understand what he is saying. And he is saying, no, don't destroy the covenant you made. Don't presume upon grace. Seek reconciliation. Extend forgiveness to your spouse. Even if they have broken the marriage covenant in sexual immorality. As a believer, you're permitted perhaps, but not commanded. Seek to restore. Seek to bring about repentance and forgiveness. From the beginning, this is God's good design. This is God's good design. Lived out in a failing, wicked world. Now, the disciples are confused. They are confused about this whole thing. First of all, Jesus did not side with the Shama, which was that you could have divorce, but it was only for certain uncleannesses, not necessarily sexual, but cer certain serious issues. The um, Hillel view, view was that, well, divorce for any cause, and Jesus took, didn't take either side. He didn't fall into their trap. And he gives the divine side. God's good design. Focus on that. Yes, there is grace in a fallen world, but God's good design, the permanence of marriage, don't break it apart. That's what Jesus says. And so the disciples are confused because they most likely were following what the contemporary, the popular culture of their day. And so they, their, their response is quite interesting to me. They basically say, well, if marriage is permanent like you say, best not to even get into that kind of relationship. I mean, who could possibly stay married? Better not even to enter the marriage covenant. That's what they're saying here. So Jesus responds to their strange conclusion. It is strange. Jesus says, God has designed this beautiful relationship of one man and one woman who are joined by God to one flesh in a lifetime of companionship and covenant relationship. He's already said that. And they say, sounds tough to stay with one woman. You mean we can't leave for any reason? I'll pass. And Jesus' response is interesting. And many misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. And I understand why we misunderstand because he... Strange words, right? These eunuchs and all that kind of stuff in here. But he says, all cannot accept this saying, but to only to whom it has been given. Now I want to just point something out to you. This phrase, all cannot accept this saying, but only to those whom it has been given, is referring to the next phrase he's going to say. He's going to repeat again at the end of verse 12, the one who is able to accept it, let him accept it. And so this is a Jewish way of teaching, where you have, all cannot accept this, the one who can accept it, let him accept it. Therefore, the main thing they're talking about accepting is this middle part. You understand what I'm saying about this? Kind of like we call it the chiastic structure there. Okay, so he's not saying, not everyone can accept no divorce, so for them, just go ahead and get divorced. Like he's not talking about the previous statement, saying not all can accept this. Not everybody's going to be able to handle this. No, he, he doesn't, doesn't equivocate on marriage's permanence by saying, but since it's hard, some of you get a pass. All right, it's not what he's saying. He's simply going to actually agree with them. They're saying, well, then if, this, if it's this hard, it's best not to get married. And Jesus actually is going to key in on this and say, ah, actually, there may be a point you have there. Not everyone's going to get this, but some will get it. What's he talking about then? He's speaking of their idea of remaining single. And rather than argue with them about the validity of marriage, has he not already made a good case for the validity of marriage? From the beginning, the design of God? Yeah, he's, he's not repeating that. He turns around and actually agrees with them. But it's not just because he's saying, oh yeah, it's too hard to be married, to be single. It's because of something else. 
He's actually turning their attention away from the earthly relationship to a greater relationship. He's essentially saying, yes, sometimes maybe it is better to remain single. And for some people, this is perfectly normal. Some people have no choice in it. He describes them being eunuchs from birth. That means there is a physical condition that removes their desire for marriage and ability to procreate in sexual activity. Some people are chosen to be eunuchs by men and in royal courts. Some men were made eunuchs, unable to have children, in order to keep them focused on the important royal duties. And still others choose the route of being single. Now most believe that Jesus is not talking about self-castration or physically harming yourself in this final example. But in response to the disciples who say it's better not to get married, he is essentially saying, for some, this is the case. For some, maybe. Maybe, we, maybe it would be. You, you, you say it, the disciples say it as if, oh, this is too hard. We're just not going to get married. And Jesus' response is, okay, maybe for some of you that is a good idea. Okay, but why? Some are born that way, they can't help it. Some are made that way, they can't help it. Why would someone choose not to be married? He's steering from the disciples who are viewing marriage as a burden and the Pharisees who both seem to think they'll be devastated by it if they don't get their way in marriage, in sexual relationships. Jesus seems to be urging them to consider that either way, marriage or in this particular case, singleness, the kingdom of heaven is more important than the temporal relationships of this life. If one is able to accept his singleness as a means to live more soberly for the kingdom of heaven, then let him accept it. If one does not, then be married. Paul says a very similar thing in Corinthians. And this is the amazing connection, my friends. Jesus takes a deceitful question by the Pharisees and a confused misunderstanding by the disciples and turns it into a sermon about the value of the kingdom of heaven. At the end of the text, he says, those who have made themselves eunuchs, or why would someone choose the single life? And he says, for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And he is saying this, listen, and all the wrang wranglings about this law and this, and what about this? And boy, I just shouldn't even get married if it's going to be that tough. And then, well, I can't be single. And Jesus says, listen, there is something more important than all of it. It is the kingdom of God. And the reality is, Paul says, tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that marriage is a profound mystery, but it speaks to a greater reality. It speaks to the mystery of Christ's love for his church. And so we learn that marriage points to a greater union. Though the purpose of marriage is a covenantal companionship, the greatest effect of a godly permanent marriage is to preach the good news that Jesus Christ loves his spouse, his church, his assembly of believers. He loves them so much that he sacrificed himself in our place while we were yet sinners so that he might lead us in love to his Father forever. He proved his love with an everlasting covenant, a promise that he will keep forever to be our husband, the one who loves and cares for us. The purpose of marriage being companionship shows us that through faith in Christ we are united to God in loving relationship. The persons of marriage too shows us that God has only one bride, his church, one way to God through Christ alone. The primacy of marriage shows us that Christ loved us while we were sinners, died for us, laying aside his right to be known as God to redeem us. The point of marriage, one flesh, helps us understand that he wants us to be one with him, uni united with the Son forever. And ultimately, the permanence of marriage. This is why it is important we express the permanence of marriage. The permanence of marriage shows us and preaches soberly to us that even in our unfaithfulness, God is faithful. He has ordained us to His home. He goes to prepare a place for us. He said that no one can pluck you out of my Father's hands. He says that there is reserved in heaven an inheritance for you. We are kept 
by the power of God. You see, the permanence of marriage ought to be screamed from the, from the rooftops and from the churches and from our lives. We ought to pursue a permanence of marriage, not just because, of what, because it's good and nice to have someone to, die, to grow old with and to die with, but because we, by proclaiming the permanence of the marriage relationship, we are, we are giving a, an example, a proclamation, a shadow of the permanence of our relationship with Jesus Christ by His faithfulness alone. And this is why I encourage those within difficult marriage relationships, even if it seems like there's just no reason for me to stay in this relationship. It's all terrible. You know what he has done. You know what she has done. And the answer is, but what have you done to Jesus Christ? And yet he holds you fast. If for no other reason, staying in a difficult marriage allows you to preach the gospel of God's constancy in an uncertain relationship. Don't miss the opportunity to be a walking, talking testimony of the grace and mercy of God. Who, while we were yet sinners, died for us. He didn't say, well, when you straighten it up, when you finally mean business, then I'm with you. In our ugliest days, he holds us fast. What do we picture in a marriage? Marriage points to a greater union. If you are married, pursue a godly marriage. Pursue a permanent marriage. Pursue a companion type marriage. Pursue a one flesh marriage. Not just for your sake, but for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Pursue it. To preach Christ's loving covenant of mercy. But my friends, that is not all. Most get married. And because of that, many Christians have treated single Christians poorly over the years. As if the reason they are single is because there is something wrong with them. Or perhaps they haven't found the blessed life yet. And one day when they grow up, they'll get married. And my friends, I, this is just wrong. We must recognize that there is no spiritual advantage to being married. There is no spiritual disadvantage to being single. In fact, Paul describes both as ministries of God, gifts of God. The church needs to do a better job of caring for single people. I need to do a better job of caring for single people. In the ways that marriage points to a greater union with Christ, if you are single, your singleness points to a greater hope in God. Points to a greater hope in God. Do not pine away about being unmarried. Yes, this is difficult in a culture that has often made sexual and intimate relationships the goal of life. I know that. I hope I'm not being taken as saying this flippantly. But that is not the scripture. That is our culture. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul the Apostle points out that a single person is often able to live more devotedly to the Lord for the kingdom of God's sake. Now he's careful not to criticize single or married people. But he does indicate that both singleness and marriage are to be thought as ways in which God has enabled us to live for his kingdom. So I might just encourage married people don't be constantly trying to set single people up. As if you think that by doing this, I'm going to finally help them achieve their identity in life. Paul, I think, puts it best when he says, Are you married? Seek not to be loosed. <laughs> Are you loosed? Seek not to be married. <laughs> now, don't make the pursuit of one or the other your goal. What should then be the goal? To point to a greater union and a greater hope. However God has given you at this time in your life. Maybe you're single now and you won't be forever. Maybe you're married now and you'll be single later. At this point in your life, God has given you and I an opportunity to live for the greatness of the kingdom of God. So I encourage single people as well. Live your gift to the Lord. You have opportunities to spend time in the service of the king that often married people don't. You do have opportunities. If you can accept it, accept it. That's what he says in the text of scripture. 
So much of singleness is wasted as it relates to the glory of God and the good of his church by selfish living or ceaseless hand wringing. My friends, there is a greater purpose. Your identity is not wrapped up in your marriage or lack thereof. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. Embrace that. Beloved, you are married. May God make your marriage such that the gospel is clearly proclaimed with grace. Don't give up on the difficulties in marriage. What you preach by your marriage points to the gospel and don't despair when it seems impossible. It seemed, probably seemed impossible that you were ever to be redeemed in the first place. God can redeem broken things. There is a greater union than your marriage union. Be faithful as Christ is faithful. Be married for the kingdom of God's sake. If you are single, be single for the kingdom of God's sake. Use your gift of singleness to advance the gospel. There is a greater hope. Your identity is not tied up in your earthly relationships, but in your relationship with Jesus Christ above all human relationships. Your singleness, when embraced with joy, can be the greatest means to show the greatness of God's kingdom and the hope that is there. Just as marriage, when embraced with joy, says shows the greatness of God's union in His kingdom. Praise God for marriage. Praise God for singleness. It's for His kingdom's sake. Let's pray.